pornography. It is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when your kid sees it. The average age that kids see pornography now, they, they really did a lot of research on this a couple of years ago, and the average age was 11. Now, they're in the early stages of researching again. It looks like the number's going to come in at eight and a half. Eight and a half years old. Kids are seeing it regularly at a very young age. My daughter, so I have a daughter who's a sophomore at Fremont. Uh, I, I talk to my kids about porn all the time. My, my son has a, a friend who, so Bishop Clark, so I'm in the 10th floor. Bishop Clark asked me to come and do a, a presentation at a youth conference, and I went and did it. Bishop Clark would mention, he says, I think Brother Heron's nervous about talking to And uh, my son's best friend came up to me after and he says, you know, Brother Heron, I don't think I've ever been around you. You haven't talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know, I'm sorry. I just, I don't, don't look at it. You know? I tell him all the time, I said, if my son sleeps over at your house and you show them porn, your friendship's over, man, we're done. <laughs> um, but, but pornography is so common. It's, it's our, our kids are going to see it. it it's just readily available. Um, they also did a recent study where they found that 10% of seventh graders are concerned they're addicted to porn. Seventh graders, too much. Um, what I was gonna mention about my daughter though is she saw porn for the first time a couple of months ago and she plays violin. I don't know if any of us saw her at a state conference or anything like that, but it's worth the price because she, she's fantastic. Um, but she was looking up something on her iPad about violins and porn. So we have a we have a blocker on our Wi-Fi at home, and because it was about violins, it didn't block it. So she came and told me. She says, "Dad, I saw porn." I said, "What happened?" And she told me about it. And she says, um, "You know, I, I clicked on this. It popped up. Then I was trying to X out. It wouldn't X. So I turned off my iPad, and then I turned it back on, and then I X it, and then it went away." She was looking at violin stuff. I remember a couple of years ago. Um, downloading what I thought was the top 10 NBA dunks of the year. And to my surprise, it was porn. So I downloaded it and I clicked play and popped up. And I was nervous too, because I had my laptop there and there was a window right behind me. I was like, watch somebody in sports walking by and I'm like, the hands looking porn. Um, <laughs> but it was, it, it said literally on my top 10 NBA dunks of the year. And then when I actually got it and played it, it was porn on the it is incredibly common. Now I'm gonna throw a fun stat at you. This one will make you go. The number one porn site in the world is called Pornhub. Don't look it up. Um, but Pornhub is the number one porn website in the world. In the year 2019, Pornhub added enough new content, okay, just new stuff, enough new content that if you started watching it right now with no sleep, and you did not stop, you'd get done in 169 years. That's one website. That's just new content. That's not even the great stuff from 2017. That's just 2019. I don't know what it is for 2020, but I would guess it up the end even more with COVID and everything. They offered free memberships to help people enjoy their time on during the pandemic when we have the social distance. Free premium memberships, you know, just doing their part. So they really come after us. Um, research also shows that a younger a boy is when he watches pornography, the more likely he is to be promiscuous and to want power over women. Again, unacceptable. Yeah, we can't let it happen like that. I will say, though, this is not just a male problem. The numbers are going up in women as well. A lot of parents will come in and they're worried about their sons, but they're not paying attention to their daughters. I, I've had several women come in. I have a, a young lady who comes in to see me right now. Her dad's a bishop and she can't tell me she's a bishop. She just can't bring herself to do it. So we talked about it. Yeah, you're talking to her. Um, now, again, I think this impacts the way men treat women. My daughter, again, she's a Sophomore at Fremont, she's cute as can be, right? I'm uh, I'm biased as her father, but she genuinely is as cute as can be. She's gorgeous, super, super nice young lady. As far as I know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I hope so. Um, but she tells me some of the things that people say to her at school. She told me um, in junior high, she has boys tell her her chest is too flat, that her butt is too flat. They've called her a whore. They've called her a slut. 
they called her a hoe. I mean, and my daughter is super kind of super nice, super sweet, she's gorgeous. And she got voted at Rock when we were at Rocky for two. She got voted most likely to be America's next top model. She's super cute. And my boys are saying stuff like this. We got to teach our sons how to treat them. It's we need to tell them how to treat them, not just how not to treat them. Too often we're not proactive in that. We say, oh, you gotta be nice. Okay, but what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we do that? Um, now, pornography is highly addictive. Now we're gonna talk about dopamine. I don't know if you're familiar with dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical in your brain that comes out heavily when we experience pleasure and enjoyment. So the dopamine comes, if BYU beats Utah this year, I'm gonna have a massive dopamine crush, right? So I'm preparing myself for the lack of dopamine on that day. But uh, dopamine comes out heavily with a couple of things. Number one, when you have an experience that exceeds your expectations. And number two, novelty and variety. So if you think about that with internet pornography, you are one click away from something different that you haven't seen before. Oh, that looks good. Click, dopamine, click, dopamine, click, dopamine. Now, dopamine is different than any other neurotransmitter in the body. So serotonin and a couple of other neurotransmitters also bring out pleasure and enjoyment, but they, they follow a pathway. I don't know if you ever heard about the pleasure pathway. They used to talk about that in psychology class and biology in school, um, where they felt like, oh, follow this little pathway in your brain. Dopamine doesn't do that. Dopamine is actually different than that. It's like taking a squirt bottle and spritzing your whole brain. So serotonin and some of these other chemicals, they do follow a pathway. It's like the lights on your house, the Christmas lights on your house. Dopamine is like Temple Square. It just lights you up and your body and brain crave it. Once you get dopamine and then it goes away, your brain's like, man, that was awesome. How do we get that again? Porn. So when you look at porn, you get that dopamine rush. And then your brain says, man, we need some more of that because now that's gone. How do we get it back? And that's part of why internet porn is so addictive compared to magazines. It used to be that people that have the magazine, same pictures, tell your subscription, magazine comes in next month. Now you got access to so much new stuff. Again, 169 years or on one site of clicking on something different and getting that dopamine rush repeatedly. Now, again, teenagers, Dopamine's more impactful on the brain, okay? So it, it hits even harder. They need that rush in order to feel fulfilled. Otherwise, they're whining about being bored. This isn't fun. So it, it's hard as adults to not tell them to just suck it up, but that often doesn't get the job. They still complain, they still feel miserable. Now, sexting. Are we all familiar with what sexting is? So this is very popular now. Sexting is basically sending and receiving some kind of illicit images back and forth between people, often themselves. Uh, it's very common, it's becoming increasingly common. I'll ask teenagers a lot of times in my office, have you ever sent or received a sex? And almost everybody says that they've either received one or been asked for one. Many of them will tell me, no, I've never sent one. Um, but Many of them say, oh, yeah, I get asked one all the time. The girls get asked one. And for guys, it's like, hey, it's worth a shot. Hey, send me a picture. And then they say, no, okay. But they say, yes, it's sweet. I've got this picture of this person. I have a client who went to a local high school several years ago, and she had a guy bugging her about, send me a picture, send me a picture, send me a picture. And she says, no, no, no. So finally, okay. So she sends him a picture of her in her, her bra and underwear on Snapchat. We talk about Snapchat. On Snapchat, the guy screenshots it. So Snapchat, you send a message and it disappears after a certain number of seconds. This guy screenshots it and shares it with all his buddies. So she she referred to it. She said, I became the school skank. That's what she said. And all these guys would walk past her in the hall and kind of look at her and laugh and make comments and stuff. And this is a good kid. She's a good kid. She made a really poor choice and she paid for it. She no longer lives in the state. Her sister comes to see me and we've talked about it. She said her, her sister since she graduated high school, she bailed because of how this affected her. And she made, again, teen split second reasoning. She made a poor choice that impacted her tremendously. Um, sexting happens very, very regularly. Um, now, kids will often hide those images. They'll save them and hide them. 
if your kid has two calculators on their phone, one of them is probably storing apps of some sort. Your phone comes stocked with a calculator, but there are apps that allow you to hide images through a calculator. So you pull out your calculator and then you punch in whatever math equation you pick. 55, 12 times eight, enter, boom, now I get to look at the images. So I don't know how to get into that. If my son's got one of those, I, I'm not gonna guess his math equation. There are also apps, one of, one of the famous ones called Balti Stocks, where people store images that way. And if you try to punch in the code so that you can get in and see what's in there, it will take a photo of you so they know who's trying to get into their phone. So, yeah, see, this is dire, isn't it? It feels terrible. Uh, I'm glad to I'm glad to bring such good news to you. You know, but that's all I've got for today. Um, no, it, it it it's hard because those kinds of things are so common. It's almost like everyday life for them. Um, I have a teenager who tells me something that's trending right now at Fremont that I have not been able to bring myself to say in front of an audience yet because it makes me so uncomfortable. And I'm not going to do it now. She won't know after it comes on to me. <laughs> I, when she told me that, I was like, oh my gosh, it made me so uncomfortable. Um, they are finding ways to get around this stuff so that we don't know what's going on. And they're good at it. it. It's kind of frightening how good at it. Now, we're going to hit on social media real quick, and then we'll get into a little more of what do we do about some of this stuff. Where are we? Okay, we're doing good. Social media. Um, the average person who's on social media spends two and a half hours a day. That's 17 hours a week, which is two full days of work for a normal eight to five job. Now I'm on social media. I have a Facebook page and that's, that's all I've got. I typically click on it, see if my wife's posted anything about the kids or whatever, and I'm out. So I spend probably less than 10 minutes a day on it. That means there's somebody who's spending about five hours a day to counterbalance me to get to that two and a half hour average. That's not even screen time, that's just social media. We're not talking about thinking with games and texting anymore. I work in the beats department and we do um, we do the physicals for the kids. And one of the questions is how much screen time, yeah. how much uh, phys physical activity time. And most of those kids are telling me seven to eight hours a day and we know that they're not being truthful. It's more than that. They're staying up at night in the dark yeah. when you think they're in bed. Yeah, a lot of kids do that. And a lot of parents don't regulate it. That stuff. We have to kind of buffer that and know it's gonna be higher than what they're actually telling me. Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time doing it. I had, a, I had a kid come in once and he had, I was so irritated at him. But he was built like Dwayne Johnson, so I had to just deal with it. <laughs> Um, he came, he was a high school senior and he was this big, huge kid. And he had convinced his mother that I had told him a good way to cope was to play a video game. So his mom comes in one day and she says, Can I talk to you? I said, Yeah, come on. And she sits down and she says, Why did you tell so and so that video games is a good coping strategy? And I just looked at her and I said, You seriously like believe that? And she says, Well, that's what he's been telling. I said, Well, that's not what I told him. So I bring him in and I said, Man, you punk. You told your mom this, and he starts laughing. He said, I had a good run. <laughs> so we calculated it, and he was spending an average of nine hours a day playing video games while school was in. This was not the summer. He would get home from school. He would play for three hours from about 3.30 to 6.30, have dinner, then play from about 7 o'clock to 10 or 10.30 at night. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, we're talking 10 or 12 hours a pop. So it goes, I don't know how he looked like Dwayne Johnson when He's playing so much video, I don't know if he's pumping all the plans or what, but um, it's nuts. So we got to be careful about this. A couple of years ago, I, I lived in Syracuse, and they were reorganizing our stake presidency in Syracuse, and Elder Christensen, Greg Christensen, came, and he was presiding over the conference and, and changing the stake presidency. And we had a leadership meeting on the Sunday morning, and he did a Q&A, and somebody raised their hand and said, hey, how do we regulate our kids on their devices? How do we regulate their, their usage, their phone use, all the stuff? We can't get our kids to stay off of it. And his answer was really interesting. I thought for sure he would just say, oh, you got to have these protections. You got to have this and this. 
what he said was, is he said, their using of a phone is a great opportunity for them to learn how to listen to the Holy Ghost. He said, those phones provide a lot of temptation, but they provide a lot of opportunity to do good. And the Holy Ghost will prompt them to do good things with it. It'll prompt them to send a friendly text message or complimentary text message to somebody. Hey, you did great today when we played musical number in Sacramento. Or, hey, you look cute at school today. Or whatever. Great job in the game on Friday. Those kinds of things can be there. Or, look at porn. Take a picture of yourself and send it to somebody. Greg, Elder Christensen, he even called it a live phone. So he said, you can, he said, it can really direct us. It can guide us in certain ways to, to help make good decisions. But our kids need our guidance on that. It doesn't mean they need free reign. Now, how you decide to do whatever you do with your, your kids on social media is, is up to you. We'll talk about some of my suggestions. I would recommend if it were me that you not let your kids have Snapchat. They will come to you and they'll say, but that's how everybody communicates. Well, they can text you if they want to talk to you back. I have seen so many problems come from kids on Snapchat. And Snapchat made a few changes to try to make it so it wasn't quite as rough that way. And so a lot of parents kind of re-embraced it after that. If it were me, I wouldn't do it. Yes. What age would you start social media or like smartphone? That's a tough question. It, it depends on the maturity of your kid, honestly. So, so my kids, we let them have phones starting in junior high. But we have, we use a family link app on our phone where we can control, they have to get us to approve any app that goes on there. And then we get to regulate how much time they can spend on each one. And so that, that's what we use. And so there are certain apps that we don't let them have. And there's others they can spend as much time as they want, but they only have a certain amount of time they can even use their phone today. Uh, and it's funny because they'll start coming up to say, hey, can you add more time? Can you add more time? And they'll come up with these excuses. They'll say, oh, Tomorrow's Sunday and I forgot to set my alarm. Can you give me 10 more minutes so I can change my alarm and then texting furiously and stuff like that? So, yeah. So, there's a problem though that I came across yeah. with Google. Yeah. At 13, they can go in without their parents knowing that they're in and remove all parents' permissions. Yeah. And, and it may be good to take Chrome off of the phone too. Like that, that's my, my daughter's in high school. We allow her to have Chrome with my team in high school and we took Chrome off because of that. And there's a little side, you can push a little side button and Google will pop up. And so it's kind of a little roundabout where you take out the phone. Um, the problem too is technology always fails. It just does. I work with a lot of guys who are struggling with pornography addiction. And so they'll utilize resources to monitor their usage. And, and there will be reports that their wives can check and that they can check. And there are times where it will just be faulty. Can't rely on that completely. It, it's a tool to use. It's something that can be helpful. But if we're relying strictly on that, uh, we're, we're not. We're not we should, we've got to talk to our kids about this stuff. Um, a lot of teens report that social media leaves them feeling less than. You know, uh, all my friends take more vacations and, and they've got a bigger house. And that friend looks better in a swimsuit or he's a better athlete or his dad drives a Tesla or whatever it may be. It, it's hard to look at and feel like, oh, my life's not fun like theirs because they're doing all these cool things and we're comparing our everyday life to their highlight reel. And of course, we're going to feel like this thing. You know, if I can, I'm a decent basketball player. I'm not very good anymore, but I used to be pretty good. But if I'm comparing myself to Steph Curry, I'm terrible. I'm not going to be feeling very good about that. If my standard's Steph Curry, I stink. So we've got to be careful about what we're comparing ourselves to and what our, what our end goal is with that. Um, I had a, a client, TikTok, I'd be careful with, by the way, that one's super vital. I had a client who came in and she's, she's LDS. She, um, she came in and told me about how she's dating this guy and he was kind of pressuring her to do some sexual things. She didn't want to do it. She said, no, no, I'm good. But then she saw a video on top, on TikTok about how to please your man. And she saw that and thought, that's a good idea. Now, very sexually active with this guy, and it all stemmed from the TikTok. I won't go into the details of what I told her to do, but it was, uh, you know, changed the way she viewed her relationship. And she got it from a source that is not what we would want them to be, where we want them to be getting information. When I was a kid, I remember my dad telling me, he said, son, if you have any questions about sex, come ask me because your friends are stupid and they want to learn something. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, right, that okay. Um, 
I won't tell you what the question was, but we were at dinner one night when I was a senior in high school. My sister would have been in like eighth grade. And she asked my dad a question, hey dad, what's up blank? And I was blown away. This man just straight answered the question. Well, honey, it's a da 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 And he explained it. Do you understand now? She goes, yeah. And he goes, very good. And then he kept eating his food. And I thought, I thought, holy cow, he's legit. He means it when he says it. And I thought, I've been missing this resource the whole time because I thought he was bluffing. Um, I asked him about it later. I said, hey, what, what went through your head when Whitney said that? He said, my brain almost fell out. I didn't know what to do with him. You know? <laughs> he's like, you know, but he just answered the question. <laughs> Mowed along, I thought, man, that guy's stone cold, so depressed. <laughs> um, okay, so have I painted a scary enough picture for you? I mean, that's really my goal here. Is I want you to feel like there's no hope. <laughs> that is terrible. Uh, yeah, awareness is huge. The more we're aware of something, the more we can do something about it. Captain Moroni is a great example of this. Captain Moroni was incredible. He was so successful in the war. Part of why he was so successful is he knew his opponent. He would send spies out. He would strategize. He knew in advance what they were doing and how they were coming at him. And because of that, he could offer countermeasures and be victorious. We've got to do that too. Uh, that's kind of where we're at as, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles. We've got to have countermeasures in place to help our teenagers navigate this and help them figure out. One of my favorite phrases is better to fight the devil you know than the devil you don't know. If we know what we're up against, we can fight it better. We can have better strategies. If we don't know what's out there. You know, if I, if I don't know there's a fake calculator that my kid can store porn on, and the CES2 calculator, you go, ah, he must upgrade it. You know? Yeah. There's, there's schools. Are you irritated about I'm so irritated about that. My son just damaged one of his and they're trying to make me pay for it. And I said, I didn't want this thing in the first place. I told you to keep it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good point. We, we told the school, we, my kids got babies issued at Rocky Mountain when we lived in West Haven. And I called the school and I said, keep it. I don't want your combo because I can't monitor it. And they said, oh, no, everyone has to have one and whatnot. And then now my son's doesn't work. We gave it back to him and they sent me a thing that said, oh, we'll send you the bills for the repair. I said, well, I promise you I can't get anything from you. Um, I told you to keep it. I'll, I'll give him a device if he needs it. And so we, we wrote, I wrote an email to the principal and talked to him a bit. And he said, this is out of my hands. It's like it's the district. So, yes, I was frustrated with that. Um, okay. So as parents, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is we need to parent out of our highest principles here. It, it's easy to parent so much out of concern and out of fear that we try to start dictating things and controlling things. And I'll just be blunt and say that's the adversary's plan. That's, that, that's what he had. That, that's not the savior's plan. If we're just dictating all the time and, and trying to control our kids and their decisions, how on earth are they going to make a decision when we're not there to impart and control them? We, we got to teach them to be good decision makers. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have limits. We obviously want to have limits. But one of my favorite quotes from Elder Holland is he said, second only to your love, your children need your limits. So we got to have limits. But the key here is we want to help them learn how to make good decisions. Um, kids who have parents who don't set rules or don't set standards, like the, the parents who are so accepting of everything, um, those are the kids who feel like their parents don't really care. They don't want to do the heavy lifting of parenting. You know, they look at them and go, you don't, you don't care about me enough to negotiate with me and have these conversations with me. I have several kids who come in and see me and parents have very few limits. And it's amazing how often they'll admit to me that they don't like that. They admit it. They'll, they'll say, I, I, I don't know how to do this. It's part of why I'm coming to talk to you because my parents don't have ones that don't talk to me. And, and those, those limits are meaningful to them. Even if they don't like them, even if they want to negotiate, even if they think they're dumb, they see it as the fact that you care about them. They see it as that they are worth your effort as a parent to enforce some of these things and talk to them about certain stuff. Um, 
it tells our kids they aren't worth that difficulty and that's that's a struggle we need them to learn how to be good decision makers and being open with them about how do we do that well when we have this limit why do you think we might have that how will this help you inform you in your decisions if we say you shouldn't do drugs and then someone offers you drugs and you know we have this limit how can you step back and say this person's encouraging me to do drugs my parents say don't do drugs what do i do with that how do i make the decision We've got to have those conversations with them. Um, now, if we're not raising children who are able to self-direct, we're going to really miss the boat here. We, we need them to learn how to have their agency, how to have their will, and how to utilize it well and appropriately in a manner that, that's helpful for them. If we don't allow them that, they can't authentically choose to follow God. Okay. It needs to be authentic. I think it was Harold B. Lee made, made a comment once where he said something along the lines of, of we can't live on borrowed light forever. He's talking about that story of the, the ten virgins and, and living on borrowed light. We've got to have a light of our own. And if we're making decisions for them and imposing things on them, it's not going to be authentic faith in God. We need to help them develop that throughout their time with us in upbringing. I think that's a big part of Come Follow Me. The biggest predictor of your kid being active in the church as an adult is whether or not you had regular gospel conversations in the home while they were growing up. Number one predictor. So when they came out with Come Follow Me, I was like, nailed it, nailed it. Because we've got to have those discussions. We've got to have those kinds of conversations because it'll help them in their decision-making. Um, and we've got to give them space to develop that relationship with God. Now, I'm going to give you a little confession time here. Um, when I was 13, I got caught stealing. Now, if you can think of the worst place to get caught stealing, uh, I don't know, Deseret Book maybe or something like that. <laughs> think of the worst place to get caught stealing. I got caught stealing at the BYU bookstore. <laughs> okay, I'm not done. <laughs> I got caught stealing at the BYU books because I'm a Cougar fan. I was doing the part. Um, I got caught stealing at the BYU bookstore while I was there for EFY. <laughs> okay? I'm not done. <laughs> now, I had gotten special permission to be there because I was 13. And I got kicked out for stealing. I had to do the perp walk. Right down the hall while everybody stood at the door and just shamed me, you know? Now, my kid's favorite part of this, I'll throw this out there just because they'll appreciate it. My kid's favorite part of this is what I stole. So I'm going to just tell you, Ma, it's nothing but this. Your socks, right? Your so, socks. No, these are legit made for. I have two pairs, by the way. <laughs> I stole fingernail clippers. Legit. Beef jerky. Beef jerky. Deodorant and an H-Town CD. <laughs> so I had a friend who had taught me how to steal. He came to me and he says, hey man, you can still still get it for free. So I remember the first time I took something, I was in 7-Eleven, Snake of Three Musketeers. It was intense, I got a massive dopamine rush. Right? So I get out and I was so nervous, but I got a free, a free Three Musketeers. It was great, right? So I got good at it, did it some more, did it some more, got really good. I got cocky enough that I stole it. By the way, I had stolen something the day before I got away with it. But they caught me. And I remember how my parents parented me when that happened to me. There was a, I'm, I'm not going to tell you which parent did which, because I want to keep that safe in case they ever somehow see or hear this presentation. Um, when it comes to parenting, this is, this is one important guideline, is there's a difference between being responsible to your kids and being responsible for your kids. I had one parent who felt responsible for me and for my decisions. She's a female. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she felt like she was the worst mother. I remember sitting in that room. I mean, I, I was sitting in this room at BYU and my mom opens the door and she just looked at me. 
she just glared at me and it was like Simba and the Lion King when, when uh, Mufasa says, I need a moment with my son and Simba drops his head, that was me. But she felt so responsible for me that she was a bad mother. She could barely look at me. We would be at dinner and I would sit here. She sat here and my dad and my sister would talk, sit here and that's where they'd ask their sex questions and stuff. And, I'd be sitting here. <laughs> and my mom could barely look up at me. It's like if she looked up at me and saw me, she'd be like, oh yeah, I don't like that. But she would duck her head back. Um, it was tough. I lost all my friends. All my friends called me up and said, and, cause they were doing it too. All my friends called me up and said, I know you're gonna rat us out. Screw you, bro. Hung up the phone. Bailed on me. I remember walking into school, first day of school. All my buddies were right over there. And I had to walk in while they all looked at me and I walked right past her block number two. Um, it was really hard. My dad though, I remember how he handled this, and I'll tell you, it was just very helpful. He came and he sat me down. He said, did you know stealing was wrong? You know, I felt like I was fine, right? But he said, did you know stealing was wrong? I said, yes. He said, we taught you that? That, that was clear to you? I said, yes. And he says, good, you're stupid, and this is on you. <laughs> I said, okay. And he said, we don't trust you. Right? You have lost our trust, but we love you. And we will help you gain it back if you will do some of the things that we ask of you. And I remember in that moment feeling like I have control of this. Initially, I felt like I didn't have control. I just had to wait for somebody else to calm down. <laughs> but in this scenario, when my dad told me, I thought, hey, I could do something with this. I can restore and re earn trust. And that conversation that he had with me empowered me, gave me a chance to say, wow, I can do better. Now, I want to say clearly, especially since a member of the state presidency. For other than speeding, I haven't broken a law since. <laughs> okay, I just want, just want to say that, just so that we're uh, that we're clear on that. 